Wow, it's finally time to get to one of the interesting parts. Recording is all about capturing sounds from the real world to generate sound clips that we can then use in our music. If you decide to be an electronic-only musician, you probably don't have to worry too much about this. In the actual process of music production, recording is closely tied to editing, which is why editing is the section that immediately follows this one. The main piece of advice in understanding recording is that, in general, good music starts with quality recordings. Not everything can be fixed in post. I view getting recordings as involving three factors, namely instrumental technique, having a proper hardware setup, and having good mic setup and technique. Starting with instrumental technique. If you are recording instruments, there are some things that you can do that will alter the quality of your sound, which vary from instrument to instrument. For stringed instruments in general, you want to make sure that your instrument is in tune. Ideally, not only is your instrument in tune, but it should have good intonation. And what that means is that your instrument stays in tune up and down the keyboard or fretboard. No matter how high or how low you play, your notes should be in tune. And this can be a problem with cheaper instruments or instruments that are poorly set up. For electric guitars in particular and similar instruments, there are lots of different factors that you can play with that will affect your sound. Particularly, your tone and gain potentiometers will greatly affect the amount of electrical noise introduced into your sound. The higher your gain is set or the brighter your tone is set, the more noise you'll get. Also of importance is your pickup switch. Aside from simply affecting your tone, some Telecasters are wired to be hum cancelling on the middle pickup position. Whether you're using single coil or humbucker pickups will affect the tone of your sound, as well as the presence of, obviously, hum. If your strings are dirty with finger grime, they can produce a dramatically different sound from strings that are clean. If your frets are worn down or if your guitar is otherwise improperly set up, you could get fret buzz. If your electrical contacts on your guitar are shoddy, they can introduce unwanted noise. On acoustic guitars in particular, you can get finger squeaking in your recording, which may or may not be something that's desirable. On the vocal side of things, again, there are a lot of things that you can do with your instrument, that is your voice, that will affect the quality of your recording. As you may or may not have heard from my voice from video to video, whether you have allergies, whether you've just woken up, whether you rest your voice insufficiently, or whether you've warmed up, are all critical factors in determining the tone of your voice at the time. In addition, there are a lot of noises that your mouth can produce that are detrimental to the quality of your recording. The first of which is sibilance. Sibilance is a harsh, high-frequency sound that is produced whenever we pronounce an S sound, which can become irritating over time if it is particularly obtrusive in your recordings. The next noise to discuss is pop. Pop is a low frequency noise or distortion that occurs whenever we force a large amount of air out of our mouth at once, typically when we are producing P sounds. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. The main way to control pops during recording is by using a pop filter which is a mesh screen that you place in front of your microphone to prevent it from capturing pops. You can also DIY this by placing a thick towel over the microphone. However, this does have the downside of slightly muffling your voice. Another technique used by artists to control pop is by altering their pronunciation of words by substituting the B sound for the P sound. Lastly, mouth clicking. If your mouth is too dry or too wet or your tongue has a tendency to touch the other parts of your mouth a lot, you're going to hear a lot of unwanted clicking in the recording coming from the sound of saliva popping. This is one reason it is important for vocal performers to drink water, unless they're lazy like me. Now both while you're playing your instrument or while you're singing, and when you're listening to your recording afterwards, you need to develop the skill of listening to what you're playing to make sure that you're in tune and on beat, which is more difficult than it sounds. Where you can, you should record against a click, a drum track, or a metronome to ensure that you're in time. Headphones can be helpful for preventing the neighbors from hearing your latest pony zone, but they also artificially color your hearing of everything outside your headphones, particularly if they're closed back headphones. Combining this with the fact that there is latency in your audio chain, you get an issue with using headphones to listen to music while you're recording. Mainly, wearing headphones while recording can be detrimental to your intonation and rhythm. So a common trick for recording with headphones is to leave one ear off so you can still hear yourself or your instrument. 
and that's why it's important to get a set of headphones with which it's easy to do this. Personally, I like to have my headphones in front of my ears so I can still kind of hear the beat, but also hear my own voice. Other tricks that I use, but I'm not really sure if they work, include muting the drum track and only listening to melodic tracks while recording, which is supposed to help me stay in tune by helping me not get distracted by the drums. Another thing that I've tried to do is put on a reverb track while monitoring my own voice to kind of fake the singing in the bathroom effect. So those are all the things that you can do to help you get better recordings on the instrumental end. Now let's talk about hardware and hardware setup. First, the elephant in the room, the microphone. There are many microphones out there, each with their own upsides and downsides. A YouTube channel that seems to be pretty knowledgeable and trustworthy when it comes to reviewing different microphones is Podcastage, which I'll link in the slides here. That being said, for the sake of completeness, I'm also going to cover a little bit about microphones here. Microphones can firstly be categorized by their construction. There are condenser microphones, and there are dynamic microphones. There's a great deal of debate online about the actual differences between condenser and dynamic microphones. Generally, condenser microphones are recognized to be more sensitive than dynamic microphones. That is, they can capture the high-frequency components of sound with greater fidelity than dynamics. They are also commonly stated to be more fragile than dynamic microphones. But really, this depends on the particular construction of the mic that you are using. Sometimes lower sensitivity is in fact an advantage. For example, dynamic microphones are sometimes used in studios to capture vocals while the music is played out loud on speakers, and that helps you solve the caveat that we had with recording with headphones on. Microphones can also be categorized by their polar pattern, or directional sensitivity. The polar pattern of a microphone essentially characterizes how well the microphone can pick up sounds coming from various directions relative to the microphone. The most common polar patterns that you will see in microphone include the cardioid pattern, the figure eight pattern, the supercardioid pattern, the omnidirectional pattern, and you may also encounter multi-pattern microphones. Microphones with the cardioid polar pattern reject sound from the back, which can be desirable if you can control the noise in your environment to only come from one direction. Thus, microphones with cardioid polar patterns are the most common ones you'll find used by musicians and voice workers. Microphones with the figure 8 pattern reject sound coming from the sides. Supercardioid mics are like cardioid mics, but they accept sound from a narrower range of angles in the front, and also accept a small amount of sound from the rear. Omnidirectional mics accept sounds from all directions, which can be useful for recording ambiences, for example, the ambient sound of a city or a desert. They can also be useful as room mics for drum kits, essentially capturing the sound of the room as drums are being played to give the drums a bigger sense of space. Lastly, multi-pattern microphones will offer multiple settings for selecting different polar patterns. If you're considering buying a microphone, here is a little bit of a buyer beware section to save you some time. You do need to care about cables and connectors. You care about what kind of cables microphones use. They might use XLR cable, 3.5mm or 6.35mm TS or TRS cable, or some microphones just use USB. Most computers will only out of the box accept 3.5mm or USB, so you'll need an adapter or an audio interface if you want to use any other kind of cable. In addition, some condenser microphones require something called 48 volts phantom power to amplify the signal in their internal electronic components. This will require the use of an external audio interface or a power supply. On the other hand, trying to run phantom power through a mic not designed to use it will most likely damage it. There are a whole bunch of other criteria that you can really dive into the rabbit hole on. Frequency response, impedance, SPL rating, or sound pressure level, which is the maximum intensity before distorting, and that's important for miking loud instruments like drums. Self-noise, signal-noise ratio, many, many factors that you can consider. But I think I've spent enough time talking about microphones. Now it's time to talk about the recording environment. I have an embarrassing recording environment. When properly setting up your recording environment, there are two main factors that you want to control, namely reverb and noise. Now I'm sitting very close to my microphone, so it's more difficult to hear the reverb in my room, but if I step a little bit back from my microphone, it's very easy to tell that I'm in a small room with lots of reflections going on. And that's sort of the hallmark of a low quality recording environment, because you can't extract that room sound using editing it's just gonna be stuck there. You can always add more reverb in post, but you can't take it away if it's been baked into the recording. Now a DIY sound dampening solution that you can use if you're looking to reduce the reverb in a small room is by putting up curtains everywhere. Yes, this is a fire hazard. However, using excessive sound dampening can also make a room sound dead and unnatural. Actual sound treatment of a room is a subtle and technical discipline. Or at least that's how it seems to me because it looks like black magic. Moving on to the other half of having a good recording environment, controlling noise. 
Turn off noise sources. Move away from noise if you can. Noise sources include your computer keyboard and mouse, your computer fan, appliances, construction noises, that train outside, and the jet flying over your building. When you cannot move away from noises or turn off your noise source, try to take advantage of the directional cancellation of your microphone. Lastly, for hardware, we're going to talk about the audio interface. Now, I mentioned the audio interface a few times in the microphone section, but I never explained what it was. Essentially, an audio interface is an external sound card. Now, say you, I already have a sound card. There's a sound card in my computer. It works perfectly fine. Why do I need an external sound card? That's like saying that you have an integrated GPU that comes with your CPU, so you don't need a dedicated graphics card. The audio interface is to your shitty integrated sound card, what GigaChad Hitch is to this little bitch called Spike. It offers two main advantages over your shitty integrated sound card. Firstly, less noise. I don't know about you, but my laptop's integrated sound card is garbage. It introduces high-pitched noise that's even audible through my headphones without even trying to record anything. None of that with the Focusrite Scarlett Solo. Secondly, and this may seem counterintuitive, the audio interface offers lower latency despite being external to your computer, meaning less delay between hitting a key on your MIDI keyboard or singing something and hearing it in your headphones. Rather important for musicians. Audio interfaces are often paired with their own special drivers on the OS end. This, in combination with the upgraded hardware, means that audio interfaces can dump audio to your headphones or monitors way faster than your integrated sound card, with less work from your CPU. Now aside from offering less noise and less latency, audio interfaces also offer a range of connectors with which you can connect things like microphones to your computer. Recall in the microphone section that I said that condenser microphones require the use of something called 48 volt phantom power. Well the way you get that power to a microphone is through an XLR cable. So if you buy a condenser microphone that uses 48 volt phantom power, you are also going to need an audio interface that can supply that power through an XLR connector. Aside from that, audio interfaces can offer various additional features. My audio interface, the Focusrite Scarlett Solo, has these little LED rings around the volume knobs for each input. These LED lights will flash yellow or red if my signal is clipping, something that we're going to talk a little bit more on later. Additionally, my audio interface offers something called direct monitoring or zero latency monitoring. Essentially what this is is a feature that allows me to listen to the input signals on the interface with zero latency through any headphones or speakers that I may have connected to the interface. This can be especially useful for troubleshooting recording problems. Now we're talking about the last section of recording, mic setup and technique. The main variable to consider here is positioning, and understanding how positioning can affect a whole bunch of other variables. For instance, positioning can affect the tone of your voice or your instrument. This is how it sounds when I speak above my microphone. This is how it sounds when I speak from below my microphone. This is how it sounds when I speak from behind my microphone. This is how it sounds when I'm moving left to right in front of my microphone. As you can hear, where you are relative to your microphone can have a big effect on your sound. So that's something as a vocalist or an instrumentalist you might want to control. You might find it more convenient to use a particular mic stand, for example a boom mic stand, in order to maintain a consistent position relative to your microphone. Another factor that we want to consider with respect to positioning is something called the proximity effect. This is an effect that is more pronounced on condenser microphones than dynamics. Basically, the closer you get to your mic, the more the bass frequencies in the sound that you're recording are emphasized. During the recording of this video series, I have been exploiting the proximity effect heavily. This is how it sounds when I'm only a few inches further away from my microphone. So it seems that the proximity effect is great for us, right? The closer we are to our microphone, the more we can give an impression that we have a deep, manly voice. Well. There is a caveat, and the caveat is that the closer you are to your microphone, the more it's going to pick up weird noises from your mouth. Things like popping, sibilance, and mouth clicks are much more prominent when you're up close to your microphone than if you're further away. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. I can even do this without the pop field. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. Another variable that we need to consider in our mic setup or technique is how we set our gain levels or our volume levels. The number one thing that we want to avoid when recording is clipping. Clipping is harsh sounding audio distortion that is introduced when the volume levels of our sound exceed the maximum bounds that can be processed by our computer. And here's an example of what it sounds like when I'm clipping. Again, just like with reverb, you can always add distortion in in post. And it can be used as an artistic effect, however, if you bake it into the recording, there's no way to get it out. And that concludes the recording section.